Uh, today's story is going to be a little bit different. My lab is interested almost exclusively in matters of infectious disease. Half of my library, uh, libra uh, laboratory focuses on Plasmodium falciparum, the cause of aging of the most deadly form of human malaria. But the other half of my lab is truly based in virology. And we have many different virological interests. One of those interests, though, is looking at particular disease states that may or may not have a viral etiology and using genomic technologies to get to the bottom of it. Sometimes that's successful, sometimes it's not. And oftentimes we dream up these projects simply by looking at clinical cases in our hospital that comes through UCSF, looking for unexplained uh, ailments of different kinds and so on. And, uh, and that's the way we write our grants, and that's all well and good. But now and then comes along a project from truly out of the blue. And what I mean out of the blue, this project I'll tell you about today came in a letter to my mailbox, not email, but like paper letter. And uh, it had a picture in it, which made it more interesting, because um, I don't get pictures in the mail, personally addressed to me. And we'll zoom in here, take a look at it. And that's from uh, this woman who owns a boa constrictor here. And the contents of the letter I'll summarize for you. It's simply that um, uh, I own a boa constrictor. His name is Larry. Larry's super important to me. He's my service animal. I don't know how that works. <laughs> and I've never asked. But, uh, but I've owned other boa constrictors previous to Larry, and they have all died miserable deaths from a disease called IBD. And uh, when I read this letter initially, I thought, OK, that's weird. I didn't know snakes got inflammatory bowel disease, something like that. But uh, I will reveal to you in a minute that that's not the case. And then uh, this letter sat on my desk, but it came back to me when I was cleaning my desk at one point because it says, you know, you know, not only is Larry a service animal, but he's part of my family, and she'd be eternally grateful. And how often do you get that in like a grant review? Like, be eternally <laughs> grateful if you did this project. <laughs> Most of the time, it's quite the opposite. Um, and so uh, I called the veterinarian, because it was a veterinarian's number on this letter, called it up, and he said, ah, this is not inflammatory bowel disease. This is called inclusion body disease. And yes, it is a real thing. Uh, it is a bizarre disease in snakes that is typified, when I mean snakes, pythons and boas, uh, it's typified by CNS abnormalities, this thing called stargazing, I will show you in a minute, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, snakes ultimately waste away. They suffer a variety of different disorders, including opportunistic infections. It's essentially always fatal. And zoos and aquariums and other institutions are very much aware that it is highly transmissible. And so if you put a sick snake in with a bunch of healthy snakes of the same variety, they will eventually get sick and die. And so zoos and aquariums operate on a, um, a basis by which if they discover a snake that has this disease, and by the way, it's diagnosed by the presence of these enormous intracytoplasmic inclusions in virtually all tissues throughout the body. This is why, of course, we suspect a viral entity. Uh, if a zoo gets a, a histology slide back like this from one of their snakes, their <coughs> MO is to just cull the snake, sacrifice it, and any snake it's ever had contact with, or any snake in the same room. Because it's that transmissible, and it's, and it's, it's, it's unresolvable after that. And of course, you don't want it spreading throughout your collection. So I didn't know how distinct this clinical entity was or how prevalent it was. And so I guess you know, this is the age of science 2.0. You can just sort of uh, uh, just go to the web and figure it out. And, um, and one of the ways you do that is go to YouTube. And so I asked very simply, you know, can I find IBD in, in six? Well, that search doesn't work so hot. But inclusion body disease works, or even better, uh, the, the, the best search is, my snake is sick. And so I'm going to show you here some symptoms. You know, this, this does have audio, but it's, it's, uh, it's not really required. I'll narrate it if you can't hear it. This dog gets a video. So if you guys think, I have a vet appointment this Wednesday. So 
And that's the way most of those, uh, those things go. What you can see here, what you can observe, is that these irregular movements of the snake's head, oftentimes flipping over backwards. Uh, and in this severe case here, this one's having some more uh, you know, seizure-like symptoms. But it does one thing in particular that's sort of interesting here at the end. It will often, snakes will often end up on their back like this. And you just don't find snakes on their back. In the business, this is called failure to recover from dorsal recumbency. <laughs> <laughs> this is classic stargazing. And this is a, a snake with confirmed IVD. And oftentimes, the snakes will lock up in these weird configurations, sometimes in knots, for hours and hours on end. And, and so obviously, there's some encephalitis-like thing going on in these snakes. Now, at this point, remember the letter I got was about Larry. And Larry's fine. Larry doesn't have IVD. So Larry's not a candidate for this study. Uh, but I did ask around the local vet pathologist. And our own California Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park, you've been there, it's a wonderful place. The Steinhardt Aquarium underneath in the basement has a tremendous collection of reptiles, including some wonderful snakes. And we've learned through our pathologist, vet pathologist, that the Cal Academy of Science, the Steinhardt, was indeed having an outbreak or problem, we wouldn't call it an outbreak, but a problem with IBD. And so uh, we were able to intervene, basically get contact with Dr. Freeland, the head veterinarian, exotic veterinarian over there at the Cal Academy. He also has worked at the zoo. And he was able to secure us some tissues from samples that they were culling. Remember I said that they eliminate all snakes in a room if one was sick? Well, they had a young snake, a so-called poor doer, who was doing poorly. And uh, they, they eliminated, they found it to be IDD positive, And so they began to sacrifice all the snakes in the room. Now, we didn't get all the snakes that were in that room. We only got some of them because we only intervened sort of halfway through. But we did get six. Five we knew were positive, and one was negative. Now, they weren't telling us which were which when we actually got the samples. So in the days of, uh, in the early days of viral isolation, so when you would try to culture a virus, you would look by serology, you would guess what kind of virus it was by PCR. You might try and purify that weird inclusion body and do protein sequencing or something like that. And these days, you know, it's all about sequencing. And so we just sequence the heck out of stuff. And now there's issues with this, and I'll get into them in a minute. But the bottom line is we took tissues from these snakes from the California Academy of Science, library prep them, barcode the heck out of them, and then sequence them on our high seat. We're looking for about 6 million sequences for six tissues for each snake, six million per tissue. This is Mark Stenley's work at postdoc in the lab, who's done a tremendous amount of, uh, of work on this project. It was originally initiated by Amy Kistler. So the usual game that we play with human samples when we do a process like this is very simple. You just take the sample, and the first thing that you do is just get rid of all the host sequence. You know, I call this background subtraction. And you can do it by bow tie, flat, blast, or your favorite alignment algorithm. But any way you cut it, you're just getting rid of the host, which you don't care about. Because the hypothesis is that there's an exogenous agent somewhere in there, and you don't really care about analyzing the host. Uh, now, lots of people, and when you get down to a very small amount of sequence at the end, then you can do more expensive stuff, like HMM searching or de novo assembly, and more uh, detailed view of things. But you don't need to do that on the whole host. And when we do just total shotgun sequencing from various tissues, well, it's mostly host. Now, this sort of subtraction, background subtraction, has been, been called like a novel pipeline by like 10 or 12 papers. I don't get that. It's just background subtraction. Um, let's move on. So <laughs> the problem for us and snakes is that we don't have the host, or we didn't have the host when we started. And so those of you in the field might know of the Assemblathon 2 competition. Uh, uh, it was a collaborative effort uh, uh, put up by Ian Corp, David Hausler, and <coughs> colleagues to basically look at uh, assembly methods and improve them by having many groups independently assemble these. There's an uh, Assemblathon 2 paper coming out. It's not out already. There's an Assemblathon 1 paper. If you're into this, I encourage you to read them. They're very interesting to see how the various different groups did on this. Uh, when this was originally getting started, I was on that conference call. 
uh, as to what genomes we might want to put forward as candidates for Assemblathon 2. And it had to be something pretty distant from anything that had been done. It had to be big. And, uh, and I said, hey, you know, why not the red tail boa? I mean, just pulling one out of the sky. <laughs> and so as part of Assemblathon 2 and Genome 10K, Illumina graciously agreed to do the paired end sequencing and made paired libraries for this. And the, the rest is in the paper, and I encourage you to read that. The snake that was sequenced was from the California Academy. It was a snake named Balthazar. He was a healthy red tail boa, not one of the sick ones. This is our vet that we work with at the California Academy. And when we're done filtering all that stuff, this is what we end up with. For the boa constrictor, uh, we end up with like 5% of sequence left, which is great. We got rid of 95% of the sequence. The annulated tree boa, a little less, but not bad. And then we get rid of all the other low complexity junk and so on. The first pass, before doing anything really that hard, is just to do sort of read level inspection and say, well, if we just blast X this stuff, do we get any hits to the viral database at all? Luckily, this step reduced those hits because all the endogenous viruses present in the snakes would be in this background. And indeed, when Mark did this, we were pretty amazed to see that there was really only one category of virus that came up with any substantial statistical hits. And that was in the class of renovirus. I'll more to say about this in a minute. But here are the samples, and this is the number of just blast X hits to a renovirus for each of the tissues for each of the samples. There's one here with just sort of background level stuff, and that is the one that was uh, negative by history. So that was revealed to us later. Now, all these hits are to RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Very little hits outside of that. And so just because you have hits to RDRP doesn't really mean you have an arena virus, per se. And the, 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 the stringency with which we're matching these by BLAST-X is not you know, super conservative or stringent. What's an arena virus? Well, first we have to talk about that for a second. Arena viruses are negative strand RNA virus, a single strand. Except they do this ambisense transcription, which means genes are transcribed both ways. So in the first copy, the L gene, the RNA polymerase, is made here. Then the antigenome is made. And then the matrix protein, Z, can be made in the opposite direction. It has two segments. And on the other segment, nucleocapsid can be made the first way. And then on the antigenome, the glycoprotein, which is post-translationally cleaved, can be made in the other way. So they're freaky little viruses. Why do we care about arena viruses, and why is that interesting? First of all, all known arena viruses to date are in rodents, and they're biothreat agents. They're, um, they're select agents. There are new world arena viruses and old world arena viruses, and they're broken up by their geography. They're all posted in various rodents, and they can be occasionally zoonotically transferred to a person. If you're unfortunate enough to get Lhasa virus, or Machupu, or Junin, you will get likely a hemorrhagic fever, and Time to death is like five days. So it's a terrible disease. These are hemorrhagic fevers. They're very nasty. There are some that aren't as nasty. LCMV is a, is a classic model organism, arena virus, although in pregnant women or immunocompromised hosts, it will cause uh, death. Uh, and so this is why they're interesting, but this is pretty bizarre. All known arena viruses are rodent and rodent only. So is this a real arena virus, first of all? Well, I only showed you, well, I only told you that we had hits to RDRP. The next game in this, um, ep in this story here is trying to pull out all the reads that belong to this arena virus. This arena virus, by any stretch of imagination, looks highly divergent. And in genes other than the ultra conserved RDRP, we're not going to be able to recognize them at the read level as being belonging to a virus, especially in a metagenomic sort of context. Fortunately, uh, we've been working on that problem a bit. You could, of course, use your favorite de novo assembler. Uh, and then in our case, Graham Ruby in our lab uh, wrote his own. And the idea was to write a target assembler specifically for this problem, to pull out only the thing of interest from a very large set of otherwise irrelevant reads, starting with some sort of seed, a blast hit, an HMM hit, or something like that, without assembling all the other stuff. It's an inductive assembler. It works by um, uh, initiating local assembly jobs under C's, and then doing meta-assembly of full context, and using paired end information, then to bring in adjacent context together, ultimately join them if there's sufficient evidence to back that up. The paper for this is out on G3, the journal G3, the Open Access Genetic Society of America journal. 
It's out on the early edition today. I'll have more to say that in a second. But just to give you an idea of how this works, we previously worked on honeybees and found new viruses in honeybees that are, are very interesting. And we used the assembler price uh, in that context. It's previously published and the data is out there. So beginning with a single read to this virus, LSV, which is a highly novel RNA virus in honeybees, in, a several, in several sets of cycles, price can then quickly assemble the whole genome into a single contig. And only one contig. No other contigs are generated from the data set. Now, if you're like reviewer number three, <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about, um, you'd say, well, that's well and good, but you haven't shown me um, your assembler versus my favorite assembler, uh, which would, I, you know, the whole assemblathon thing was supposed to be about. But, um, and so you know, you're at the beck and call of reviewer number three anyway. So uh, that's what we had to do. We did it. So here's the previously published data set for Lake Sinai virus. And to the best of our ability, running MetaVilla, Soap De Novo, Meta IDDA, and Trinity versus Price. No other assembler generates one contig full viral genome. Lots and lots of different fragments with good coverage. So not bad. Although many of these contigs from um, the growing graph-based assemblers are um, chimeric containing versions or other abominations. And, and why this is hard and why we wrote this thing is because read coverage in many of these viruses, from many of these samples, it's just all over the map. Uh, and in this case, it goes up from a thousand-fold coverage down to like a couple-fold coverage. And many of the assumptions that we make about the virus and about its segments and stuff, about the chemer contents and so on, just don't hold true in a metagenomic context. And so I would say that this assembler is really good for targeted local assembly, and it's highly complementary to the Boeing Graph assembler. You wouldn't use it to assemble a, you know, a gagabase genome. It's not practical to do that. Uh, but for pulling out targeted things for which you have a seed, it is. It's available on the website. The source code's out there on the website as well. It's all C++, highly portable, compiles on anything with a modern GCC, OpenMP compiler, and so you can move it around. And it's highly optimized for multi-core, multi-threaded machines as well. So it's built for speed. Okay, back to the arena virus. So that's what we use. We use Price. Uh, Mark used Price and Graham Ruby, who's, by the way, in the audience today, if I can talk to him. And we assemble the entire vir uh, viral genome of the Greener virus. It's very small, it's two segments. And now the next question is, all right, it looks like the Greener virus. It's got the four genes, two segments. Here's the known Greener virus, it's old in the new world. Where does this Greener virus fit into this? Because I know what you're probably thinking. Hey, snakes eat mice. So this is just another rodent Greener virus, right? That a snake picked up in its lunch. Maybe not. So here is the phylogeny of the old and new world rodent viruses. We're dying here on the laser, sorry. Uh, NP on the left, L, the uh, ribosome, or the RD, RDRP on the right. And here are two viruses. We've, arena viruses are named where they're found. So one is Golden Gate virus, and the other is um, CASB. You can think of that as Cal Academy of Science virus, but they'd rather you not. <laughs> But now you know. Um, so you can tell by this NP and L plot that these things are highly divergent. At best, they're around 20% amino acid identity and, and, and much less in many other places of the genome. And so I would argue that these are way off the phylogenetic tree and in just in evolutionary terms likely predate uh, of the divergence of a lot of these rodent arena viruses, which brings in some interesting evolutionary uh, issues. But this is just NP and L. Glycoprotein tells you about tropism, tells you a little bit more. You can't even align glycoprotein to the rodent arena viruses. In fact, what you can align it to are the phyloviruses. That is, this virus's glycoprotein is more like Ebola than arena, another favorite hemorrhagic fever virus. Favorite? I should say famous. Um, and so that's where this guy lies. And of course, there's relationships to avian retroviruses. This was sort of foreshadowed. Uh, you know, close to 10 years ago, luck greater than 10 years ago, when Buckmeyer and Galler supposed, based just on sequence gazing, that arenavirus and phyloviruses might have had a common RNA ancestor. And this, I would say, 
suggest that that might be true. Then prove it. Could be recombination. Could be another mechanism. However, it's strong evidence in my book that they uh, indeed might be in a common ancestor. And I'll have more to say about that in a minute. But where do we go from this? What I told you doesn't prove that arena virus has anything to do with that crazy stargazing disease we looked at earlier. Uh, obviously, what we'd like to do is have more snakes. We'd like to look at immunofluorescence of the inclusions. Is the inclusion the virus? That would be helpful to know. That's the hallmark of the disease. We'd like to grow the virus in culture, because then we can make pure virus, and we can infect a, a healthy snake, make it unhealthy. And if that happens, that's well, that's Cox postulates, and that's the last nail in the coffin. No pun intended. So uh, once you do a podcast or two uh, on this story, uh, people just send you snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mark and I did like Herpetology Today uh, podcast, and then coolers of python heads uh, started showing up. One big cooler in particular. Uh, now, um, it's cool, I have enough, no need to send me more. <laughs> These were for the Florida Everglades, and the suggestion here was, well, maybe you could use your arena virus to um, biocontrol the pythons that have been released into the Everglades. As you probably, I, I can hear you already, like, super bad idea. <laughs> no telling what must happen. Now, we want to get to the live virus, because that's going to really allow us to study it, so enough of the frozen heads. The way that you um, go about making virus in culture is you would homogenize the tissue, inoculate your favorite cell line, and then you know, make some sacrifice of gods and hope and pray. Because in the game of virology, this is very often a, a losing proposition, and many graduate students have thrown their body on piles of unculturable viruses. <laughs> and, but, but Mark had no, um, didn't know this. <laughs> And so he went out and he bought the only ATCC reptilian cell lines that are in the catalog, Viper Heart, which is cool, and Iguana Heart. You can get a turtle too, and we did, but I'm just showing you these two. And, um, and as predicted, when you put the virus on these um, reptile cell lines, nothing happens. They just don't grow, they not going to go away. So then we made sort of the desperate Hail Mary, which was we made a call to local veterinarians and said, look, if you are going to sacrifice a boa constrictor anytime soon that has cancer, give me a call. Um, and I'll be damned, got a call, uh, like the very next day. And, um, and Chris went out there, sorry for the gruesome picture, Chris went out there, uh, uh, Mark went out there to visit Chris Sanders, a veterinarian, who sacrificed the snake Juliet, which is actually his personal snake, that lymphoma. We took every tissue out of Juliet that we could and put him in dishes. And then you put them at room temperature, because reptile cells don't like the regular incubator temperatures. And sure enough, all those cells died, except for one flask. And it just kept growing. They're from the kidney, but every cell in culture to me looks like a fibroblast, so they look like fibroblasts. This is actually almost 12 months later, slides are a little old. They've gone through way more than 40 divisions, so I'm ready to call them, for all intents and purposes, immortal, uh, which is really great and they're super easy to grow. Much more, as we put the virus on them, the virus took off like a shot and replicates just fine in JK cells, Juliet kidney cells. Uh, and this is super great, because now we can make pure virus, we can make antibody reagents, and we can get down to the virology of this. So in the last few minutes, I'm gonna try and prove to you that this virus, we believe, is the cause of this disease, and then where we're headed with after this. So we made antibodies to NP, we can show that in the cells that we can get detection. And in the infected snakes, or I should say sick snakes from Cal Academy, highly positive um, for the protein. We can do immunofocus assays, which allows us to titer the virus, because these viruses don't make plaques. And, uh, and we are looking at about 300 PFU equivalents per mil of homogenate from sick snakes in the Steinhardt Aquarium. So they're decently infected. Are the inclusions really virus? That's important. So in JK cells, sure enough, the virus makes large cytoplasmic inclusions. Not, they don't look exactly the same as they do in some of the histology slides, and I'll show you that in a minute. And he's just getting diffuse background on uninfected. Here's tissue from the snakes at the California Academy. So this is kidney tissue, and you can see virtually almost every cell of this snake, uh, at least in this slice, is infected with a virus and those cytoplasmic inclusions 
are highly reactive to the antibody and glow very brightly. We can even do it side by side with the traditional histopathology. Negative slides, you just get nothing on the antibody. And then here's those orange inclusions that are the typical hallmark of the disease that pathologists typically use. And those exact same inclusions light up super bright with the antibody. So we think those inclusions are aggregates of NP, possibly other stuff, but mostly NP. By immuno, um, uh, by electron microscopy, we can see typical viral budding particles that have the classic shape and size and look of arenaviruses at the membrane. This is not amino EM, so I can't prove to you that that's the arenavirus. However, we did do amino EM on the inclusions with NTNP, and sure enough, the inclusion, amino EM labels extremely clearly. So we believe the inclusion is, in fact, the arenavirus, which is probably the strongest piece of evidence we have now that it causes the disease. One more piece of evidence is we've got a lot more snakes now. Um, podcasts are good. And so we have about 40 isolates of this virus now. And we've sequenced them all uh, from different parts of the country and all over. And in, uh, we have a large number of negatives. And so far, we've never found the arenavirus in a healthy snake. And all the snakes that have been histo histologically confirmed to have IBD have indeed had arenavirus in them. What's more is that we see evidence of the virus crossing species. There's a domeral's boa to a boa constrictor. And here is a very close isolate to all these boa constrictors to a python. And so we believe that the virus can be passed from boa to python. Uh, and then we have isolates of other species that are very, very distant. OK, so this is really interesting. This means there's a very diverse family of arenaviruses and reptiles. We'll go back to that in just a second. Just to finish off, a little classic cell biology, what makes these guys different? Are they different than the arenaviruses that we see other than glycoprotein? I'll focus here on the Z protein matrix. This is sort of an interesting one. Z is interesting to the community because you can simply express a Z protein from a rodent arenavirus in your favorite cell line, and you'll get VLPs. You don't need any of the other parts of the virus. So you can make virus-like particles with one protein which is a great drug delivery mechanism and so on, and lots and lots of people have been studying that aspect of arena virology. But the Z in snakes is weird. It has a ring domain just like everybody else, but it doesn't have this thing called the late domains. The late domains are what co-op the protein sorting pathways to then do budding. And it also has a transmembrane domain instead of a MERSC layer at the end. This is a cartoon of how typical arena virus budding works. The Z, the matrix, grabs the S41 complex and co-ops it and creates these virus-like particles. Uh, instead of having late domains in Z, we find them in NP. And we can model the NP from a snake on a rodent. And in this big loop of unstructured area, this is modeled on loss of fever, we see late domains in a flexible loop hanging out of NP. So does that really grab S41 and work the same way? We can just affinity purify and mass spec it in 293 cells because it should be conserved. And sure enough, it brings down TSG 101, you get 28, other components of the S41 complex. And sure enough, we can show that uh, we can make VLPs. If we transfect NP alone, it actually doesn't make VLPs. You can look for VLPs by the package is GAP or something. Z alone doesn't make it. But if we add NP to Z, so NP is the late domain, Z is matrix. Now it makes VLPs like gang clusters. If we mutate the late domain, it makes less. If we chop off the transmembrane domain, it doesn't. And if we add a meristolate back in place of the transmembrane, it does again, which means that these are modular. We can slice and dice them and fix them and do all sorts of fun things with them. All right, we're doing the experimental challenge right now. You can imagine the rather uncomfortable conversations I've had with my eye cook about bringing snakes into the mouse house and um, infecting them with free <coughs> virus. So that, I'll, just, I'll just tell you right now, that's not going to fly at UCSF. But it will fly at UC Davis. <laughs> <laughs> They're totally cool. And, so, um, and they have the, and, and in, all, in all seriousness, they have the proper facilities to um, contain this thing. And so we are going to do this. We're buying snakes on eBay right now. Uh, and uh, we're going to do this. Uh, there, the, the, the actual reservoir of this and the evolution of it is more of my interest right now. 
And uh, since we've made this um, discovery and published it in NBio, it's given license to people to put crazy illustrations into their reviews. Here's an actual figure from a review. <laughs> And um, it, this shows what looks like a viper, so vi 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 vipers don't get this disease, by the way. Uh, and, and here's a, a mouse that's been bitten a few times. <laughs> and their idea was that maybe that the rodents are passing the rodent vi the, the, um, the viruses to the snake. They didn't know that we had all these other isolates. I would say that instead, the vast repository of genetic diversity in these um, Progenitors to hemorrhagic fever viruses may in fact reside in the reptile population. And that may be true for lots of other animal viruses, not just the arena viruses. And so uh, uh, this is a hypothesis, and we're looking at it. This may be dinosaur virus stuff. And that what you're looking at is the occasional transfer zoonotically to rodents over the millennia. And that's why we have distinct plates of arena virus today in rodents. Yeah, yeah, we, we have, have a much, much broader continuum of the snakes. So, so what, what are we doing about that? that? We're sequencing tons of reptiles. And so we have a collaboration with the Berkeley Berger uh, zoology guys, uh, Jim McGuire over there, and this is just a sampling of what we're doing. And I can already tell you, it's been rich in discovery. And uh, so stay tuned for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. This is mostly done by Mark Stangling. He's sitting there in the back. Graham Ruby wrote a price. <laughs> Somewhere in here, where are you, Graham? Well, there it is in the back. Chris Sanders is the one who sacrificed his own snake, Juliet, to make the cell line. And of course, the California Academy of Science collaborators. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Um, are there questions? Oh, we got someone way in back. All right. Have you told Larry Zoner about what you found? Have I told who? Larry's owner, the woman who wrote to you originally. Oh, oh yeah, Larry? Larry's owner. Larry's owner is totally thrilled. Um, however, Larry's still cool. Larry's not sick. So she doesn't really need to worry about this. <laughs> yes? So it's cool that you had the BOA genome to subtract. But could have you just gone against the viral databases and found it that way? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, you didn't, probably didn't need to do the subtraction to get the RDURP in all seriousness. Um, but we, usually when we approach these, you don't know, and so you just do the subtraction. If we didn't have it, we're going to do the RDRP hits anyway by Blastex, and we're just taking a little longer, but not much longer. Here's, here's the case. Here's the more difficult case. Let's pretend there were no Blastex hits. Then we go to HMM hits. HMM at the more divergent level is more sensitive than Blast when you get into the total twilight zone of homology, and that's when your three aspartate residues and RDRP become important to the right spacing. Uh, if you get no HMM hits, right, then you're back to just looking at whatever context you can make of what's left and try to make sense of that. Um, and, and that's where the game lies. <coughs> so um, related question to that, supposing you had gotten a blast X hit, would price have worked in the larger mixed sample with all the BOA uh, sequences still in there. Right, so um, th there's two parts to that. If we didn't get any Blastex hits, and, we didn't, and let's say we did HMMs and didn't get any hits there and didn't get any hits anywhere else, the one strategy that we can do, if the sequence has been reduced sufficiently enough, is just take random reads from the remaining sequence and try to build context for them or assemble them with a regular De Bruyne graph assembler and or together with price. And if you get hits out of that, then maybe you can build something that's a more significant hit in an HMM or a blast hit. If um, you had no BOA genome and you're looking at everything, the, the real problem with the, just to get back to your other question, let's pretend that we didn't have the BOA genome. The one thing that's a big problem with this, and we ran into it, is there are lots of endogenous viruses in the BOA genome. And they're a pain to sort through. Uh, and because now what you need in that case is a large set of cases and controls. And we didn't have that. 